You can be seated. All right, so I wanted to just highlight for us, um, I do this every once in a while, that we have nursery care downstairs. Actually, during this hour, Sunday school happens for all ages, three, I think two or three years old, all the way up through adult. And so just to let you know, that's happening throughout the building as we uh, gather here in worship, but also nursery care for those who might be in need of that is just downstairs and on the right-hand side of the, uh, the classrooms there. Our greeters can help you find that if you need to uh, find the nursery. Our theme scripture for us today on Reformation uh, Sunday is John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's read that together. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So uh, I talked to the... Uh, middle school students this past week because Reformation was coming up about this verse, and to be set free in the original language, uh, in the Greek language, the word is eleutheros. Some of you may have heard me say that before, so that sounds like something, right? Eleutheros? Kind of? One person got that. Okay, so it kind of sounds like Lutheran, but anyway, that's kind of a Greek word for you there. So uh, we got a holiday coming up uh, this Thursday. Uh, Anybody know what the holiday is this Thursday? Halloween, I should have asked some kids, they would have known. So, um, which I don't really want to get into in the sermon. Um, I got a podcast coming out about that this week. So you can check out the podcast on, you know, Christians and Halloween and all of that. Um, But I mention it because Halloween is a shortened version of the word All Hallows Eve. All Hallows Eve. Um, And Halloween, All Hallows Eve, falls the day before a major festival in the church year called All Saints Day on November 1st. Um, It's a big deal. It has been a big deal throughout the history of the church. It's really not talked about a lot these days, at least outside of maybe the Roman Catholic Church or Orthodox Church. But All Saints Day is a big deal because um, throughout history, that's the day that was set aside to give thanks to God for all those who have gone before us in the faith, all those who are now uh, at rest, the church in glory with Jesus Christ. So uh, it's a, it's a, a day to kind of really focus on, rejoice in the fact that we have people we know who are waiting for us and on the last day will be resurrected, receive their glorified bodies as we will ours and be with them forever. So All Saints Day was a big deal. Uh, In years past, no matter what day the week it fell, fell on, there would be major church services. Everybody would go. Not so much necessarily anymore. But in 1517, which was like a few years before I was born. Um, I know I I look pretty old, but in 1517, there was a Roman Catholic doctor of theology named Martin Luther who chose the night before All Saints Day when everybody would show up in church for mass. He chose that day to put a poster up on the doors of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. So he put that poster up on October 31st, 1517. So now, October 31st, All Hallows' Eve. That's why he put it up then. And so that's traditionally become the day that the Lutheran Church at least celebrates Reformation Day, that day when Luther posted uh, those 95 theses, as it's called. So uh, as I think about being a Lutheran, no matter really what our church background is, actually, there's a question that arises in my mind, maybe you've heard it, thought about it, is... Um, A, who is Martin Luther, and why do we follow a person and not Jesus? Why is our church named after a person and not Jesus himself? Shouldn't we be part of, like, the church of Jesus rather than the Lutheran church? Or maybe we should be part of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, wait, that's already taken. That's the Mormons. Hold on. Um, But why do we follow Martin Luther? That's kind of what a cult kind of does, is follows a person like that and gets off the rails. So that's a question that maybe you've thought of, maybe others have asked of you, or maybe might ask if you're a Lutheran. Um, Back in uh, 1879, a lady named Mary Baker Eddy founded the Christian Science Movement. And we have Christian science uh, reading rooms, churches, even here in Lincoln, right out on Church Row on 84th Street is a Christian science church. Uh, Just a few years before that, a guy named Charles Taze Russell started the Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, people followed him. Many many of us have been approached by uh, the witnesses at our door, perhaps, or seen them walk around the neighborhood. Uh, They have a big convention here in Lincoln uh, of all different kingdom halls throughout the country come here at the Devaney Sports Center, uh, typically. 
Um, so that's another uh, group that follows a person. Or what about Joseph Smith? He, Joseph Smith, years before that started, the Mormon church. We mentioned the Mormons already. Uh, they have uh, churches here. They call them stakes. Uh, Old Cheney Road, North 56th Street, other places here in Lincoln. We even had a Mormon run for president. So there you go. It's always kind of dangerous to follow an individual like that. So how come we are Lutherans and follow this guy, Martin Luther? Um, those are good questions. And if we're following Martin Luther rather than Jesus, that becomes a problem potentially. But are we following Martin Luther? What's the deal with that? Well, to answer that question, we kind of have to go back just a little bit for a minute or two and think about the man and his times back in the 1500s. Imagine, if you can, living at a time before the printing press really came into use. It had just been invented, and there were really no books. Imagine living at a time when there's no books. Uh, you've never read a book in your whole life. And everything you know about God Jesus, eternal life, heaven and hell, good and evil, all the things you know about all of this stuff, you know from somebody else who told you. And you have no way of really knowing, verifying whether that's true or not. And you, what you've been told about God, imagine this, you've been told this about God, is that God is this almighty, powerful being who's generally very angry with you and that Jesus is this judge who's going to come and bring you into judgment for anyone who violates his commandments and part of that judgment is going to be that you will spend hundreds thousands of years suffering for all the sins you've committed I don't know about you but I got a lot in my head that I know I've done and I got thousands more I don't even know about and I'm going to suffer for them for a long, long, long time. Imagine living at a time when life is nasty and brutal and short. You're imagining what life is like really for many, many people throughout the history of humanity, but that's the scene into which Martin Luther was born in 1483 in Germany. Now for reference, in terms of the, like, when is that in history, uh, Martin Luther was nine years old when an explorer named Christopher Columbus set sail. So their contemporaries, basically Columbus, a little bit older than Luther. Luther was a Roman Catholic. He was a member of a church that had existed for 1,500 years. It had been the church. He was a Roman Catholic monk who got his doctorate in theology and then was commissioned to teach at the University of Wittenberg in Germany. And that's what he did for the rest of his life. That was what he did, teach the scriptures at the university. But unlike the other people that we imagined, when he began to study for his doctorate, he got to read the Bible for the first time himself. And as he read the scriptures, it turns out that he wasn't really seeking to start a new religion like these other people we mentioned, Mary Baker Eddy and Charles Taze Russell and, and uh, uh, Joseph Smith. That whole premise, the idea that he started a new religion, turns out to not be true, really. In his capacity as doctor of theology, he got to do what almost nobody else could do in that day, and that is actually read the Bible. It wasn't until his doctoral studies, believe it or not, that he actually saw the Word of God with his own eyes. And as he read the Bible, it spoke to the depths of his soul. He was a person who was tortured by his sin because he knew his sin and he focused on his sin and he had this sense about him, as did many, many others, that God was angry, very, very angry at him. And in the scriptures, he discovered a God he had not known before. Romans and Galatians, two books of the Bible, became Luther's favorite books. In Romans chapter one, in the gospel, the good news, the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And then Galatians 3, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous 
will live by faith. Nobody who relies on being a good person in order for God to not be angry with them, that person is not gonna be justified, is not gonna be right with God. But the person who believes in God, who trusts in what God has done for him, that person is right with God. And then in Romans chapter four, it was not through the law, it was not through doing good things and being a good enough person that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world but through the righteousness that comes by faith, by trusting in the goodness of God. We just sang about the goodness of God. That's how a person gets right with God. And in fact, God is a good God, Luther discovered. He discovered the best news that he'd ever heard in the word of God, that God is a good God who loved him. And at the same time, as a doctor in the Roman Catholic Church, as a doctor of theology, he realized that these truths about the goodness of God about the gift of forgiveness, that it's a free gift. They have been hidden from him by the very church that he served. He realized not only hidden from him, but hidden from millions, and he determined to do something about that. And in his innocence, he guessed that the church hierarchy, the top people, wanted people to know about these things, but the underlings were hiding them from the people. And so since he guessed that those at the top wanted people to know about this good news, Luther set out to inform the Pope and the other heads of the Roman Catholic Church that these underlings were messing things up and not telling people what the Scripture said. And the method he chose to do that was to nail 95 theses on a poster on the door of the church in Wittenberg on All Hallows' Eve, October 31st, 1517 so that everybody who came to Mass the next day, All Saints Day, would read them and find out about the gospel. Things didn't go like Luther planned. It turned out that it wasn't some underlings that were twisting the good news of Jesus. It wasn't some underlings who didn't really want people to read the Bible for themselves, but that that, at that day, that went right to the top, actually. And so for the crime of wanting a person to read the Bible for themselves, Luther was condemned to death. How about that? Being burned at the stake. It's not the best way to go, actually. The Inquisition and all that. And so Luther nails his 95 Theses to the church door and very quickly becomes excommunicated, kicked out of the church because he wanted people to read about God's love for themselves in the Scriptures. Pretty high drama. Then in 1521, four years later, he was brought before uh, papal representatives and the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and told to recant his teachings, to take them back or be burned at the stake. That was his choice. It was kind of high drama. So we're talking a lot about Luther here, but I do that to answer this question. How is Luther different from our friendly founders of the Mormon Church or Jehovah's Witness Church or Christian Science or others? How are we Lutherans different from Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, or whatever? So here's the difference. Martin Luther did not want to point people to himself or some newfangled teaching that he made up. He pointed people to the scriptures, to the word of God, to the old, old story that had been around for 1,500 years. That's where Luther is different. Luther didn't kind of come up with some strange new ideas like don't celebrate birthdays like Jehovah's Witnesses or teach people that cancer is not real unless you think it is like Christian science does or he didn't redefine a bunch of biblical words so it sounded Christian but it's not like the Mormons do. He uncovered a simple old message, the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And so five things really characterized Luther's teaching, and I think this is a great kind of spot for us to take maybe five minutes and close with this piece. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. They're called the five solas, which is a great Latin word if you want to know Latin, but the five alones that Luther said, here's what I'm finding as I read in the Bible. I'm finding these things are alone. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And we're called Lutherans. Luther 
if he were alive today, would roll over in his grave, but then he wouldn't be alive. Um, but the idea that we're called Lutherans would just appall him because he didn't want to start a new church. He was part of the church of his day, and he wanted to stay a part of the church of his day, the church of history. He didn't want to start a new thing. And if, if he had his way, he'd probably call us the church of grace or the church of faith or the church of Christ. Well, we are Christ. But so there you go, we're Christ, Christ Lutheran, but we're Christ. But that's where Luther would go. He wouldn't want the name Lutheran really in our name, but that, that's what people called people who believed in grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. They called them Lutherans, and so that's kind of how we got our name. So that's kind of the story of Reformation Day, but it's important for us because these, these alones really capture who we are and, and what the scripture teaches us about these, these important things. So let's kind of go through them. Grace alone, Ephesians chapter two says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In other words, a dead person can't do anything, right? In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. By nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. The word for grace is a gift. It's, been, it's a gift that you've been saved. And then Romans chapter 11, if it is a gift to you that you're saved, then it's not by works. If it were, the gift would no longer be a gift. You don't get a gift at Christmas because you've been so good. I know there's a song about that from some big red guy in a red suit, but anyway, that's not why you get a gift at Christmas. You get a gift because someone loves you. And we get a, salvation is by grace alone. It's a gift to us. We don't work for it. It's just simply a gift. It's never our doing. God chooses you. In my life, I experienced me choosing God. But you know what? That's not what happened, actually. God chose me. The scripture is very clear. It's by grace and not because of something I've done. Why? Because he loves me. Because he loves you. He's chosen you to be his own. It's by faith alone. Paul writes in Romans chapter three, we maintain that a person is justified by faith, by just believing in God apart from the works of the law. And Romans then chapter four, what shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by what he did, he had something to boast about, but that's not the way it was before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. To the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It's by faith alone, simply trusting God alone. That's how we receive the gift of eternal life. Do you trust, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Then you are saved. It's that simple. Faith alone. And, but, yet faith is never alone. When someone says, I believe that Jesus died for me, life changes. Faith is never alone. Works follow faith. Good things follow faith. But that's not the reason why we're justified, made right with God. Christ alone. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's about as clear as you can get, Christ alone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. All religions are not the same. Only one person died for you and rose again to new life to give you the guarantee that you will have life forever. That person is Jesus. It's Christ alone. No other religion has that, only by faith in Jesus. And finally, well, not finally, the fourth scripture alone all of the Bible is God-breathed, spoken out by God, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. God's word, the scriptures, are the source and norm of all of our teaching. That's, it's, it's got to be in God's word. It's without error. How precious to us. You should not believe what I tell you unless it agrees with God's word. God's word is the source. It's scripture alone. You, you, we need to know our Bibles in order to be able to test what the pastor says, what the radio preacher says, what the singer says at the concert uh, down at the arena, which was a great concert on Friday night or whatever night that was. Um, we need to be able to test God's, uh, a podcaster against the word of God. The word of God is our standard. Scripture alone is the source. If we don't know the scriptures, how can we test all these words coming around us from different pastors and and podcasters and all this stuff. We have to be able to test it. We gotta know, we gotta dig into the scriptures. And finally, to the glory of God alone, all our lives, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We are called as God's people to bring glory to God in everything we do. Um, no, No matter where we are, what it is, all of it is God's. It's not like we have this little God piece over here and then we do the rest, whatever we want with the rest of our lives. It's all done to the glory of God. So grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Those are the things that really come to us as kind of basic things from scripture uh, that Luther rediscovered. It wasn't a new thing. It was an old, old story in the Reformation. So I commend um, the Reformation faith to you. Uh, these kind of principles, these solas to you as you live your life. Let's stand.